What I want to do is I want to encourage all those people who have multimedia devices, smartphones in their pockets to get them out. Okay, to get them out, to use them during the course of this lecture. Because what I'm going to be doing is I'm, I'm going to be providing an opportunity for people to give feedback using uh, Twitter. But also, I'm going to be presenting a lot of QR codes. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with QR codes, these are the two-dimensional crossword-like barcode systems which are used for encoding data and in particular in this lecture I'm using them for encoding URLs, web addresses. And so I'm going to be showing you screencasts of screencasts in action but you can use those for yourself, you can pick up those resources immediately for your own use, for your own little demos, if you point your smartphone at the QR code, the QR code will take you straight to those connections. So it's one thing for me to demonstrate these things on the screen, it's another, and in my opinion, a better demonstration if you get those things on your own devices and you play with them your own like. Right, so the title of my lecture, you might see I've sneaked in a new word. The title of my lecture is Screencasts and Vignettes, Flexible Teaching Aids for Undergraduate Chemistry. Please, last year I regretted putting the word chemistry into any of my presentations. This is not about chemistry. Okay? There are some demonstrations that have brief mentions of bits of chemistry, but please don't let chemistry scare you or distract you in any way from what this presentation is actually about. Okay, now I've got a couple of logos up here, I'll do some acknowledgements at the end, but the reason that I'm here again this year, I presented something, well none of the slides are common, but I presented on the theme of screencasts, I'm presenting on something more this time, but I presented on the theme of screencasts last year. The reason I'm here again is because through that teaching fellowship funding from the University of East Anglia for me as an individual, what we've been able to do is to be somewhat more ambitious and to branch out, to collaborate with other universities, particularly the University of Southampton, but to use the Higher Education Academy Physical Sciences Centre funding to try to do something on a much grander scale this year with screencasts, and that's where I'm going to be talking. I can show you the nitty-gritty of screencasts, or better still, I can give you links to the nitty-gritty of screencasts, but I'm going to be talking about a bit more of a grander vision of where this technology can be used. Okay, so what content we're going to have? Well, first of all, when I looked at the actual program for the first time, I realised I'd be given an hour. Now, Jeff tells me I don't need to fill that hour. It's a very dangerous thing to do, to give an academic longer than they actually require, because almost inevitably they're going to expand to fill the f space available. I will try not to let this ramble too much, is my normal forte. But I have seen an opportunity to do something a little bit more than what I originally planned, and that is to integrate Twitter, because one of the things that I'm doing is screencasting, and other things I'm very interested in doing is trying to find ways in which we can use um, social media, and in particular Twitter, because that's my favourite kind of social network. Um, how can we integrate it into lectures? So we're going to do that very early in here, and hopefully some of you will participate with that. We're going to do the obvious things like setting down exactly what I mean by the concept of a screencast. Very briefly touch upon whether we want screencast or audio cast. Really there's not much effort, in, more additional effort involved in screencasting, so I tend to go down that road. Very briefly touch upon my own personal preferred method of generating these screencasts, which is to use the Camtasia software. And then really it becomes into a sort of how much effort do you want to put into this process? Do you want to edit it? Are you a perfectionist? Are you happy to just go with the crude representation of the, of the lecture? We'll show how you can present the screencast, the tools that are available at UEA for you to get that media once you've generated it out there, and my own perceptions, my own opinions of what the strengths and the weaknesses. And then at the end, I want to present the new idea this year. And it's very good that we've got Paul in the audience because Paul has played a huge role in developing this new idea, the idea of a vignette. Lectures are long and unwieldy. Vignettes, hopefully, are interactive, short, and therefore much more appealing to transfer.
Twitter. What is Twitter? Well, there's the Wikipedia definition of Twitter. Twitter is basically a website, a social network, or a micro-blogging service, if you will, where you send SMS-like messages into the internet. People follow you, you follow them. I am uh, S underscore J underscore Lancaster. And yes, I like to collect followers, as people do when they're on these social networks. But I have to tell you, I'm, I feel like sometimes an evangelist for, for Twitter. I don't use Facebook. I'm not obsessed with social networking at all. Twitter, my best analogy for, for Twitter, well, there are two quotes. One is that Facebook takes people you know, uh, your friends, and generates enmity towards them. You start to dislike your own friends. Twitter, you discover new people you've never met before and they become your friends. That, to me, is a very good example of the difference between Facebook and Twitter. But for me, Twitter is a bit like this concept. Noel Edmonds is one of those who expound it. Cosmic ordering. You wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror, and you tell the cosmos what you want. I don't know whether that works or not. But if you wake up in the morning and you tweet a message, then by, I don't know, coffee time in the morning, you've got the answer. That's what Twitter is like. You take a message, it goes out to the people who follow you, they tweet it to the people who follow them, they tweet it to the people who follow them. In a dendrima-like fashion, you get huge uptake of this message, and then the answers come back to you. And there is nothing like Twitter. Not that I'm aware of, I think it's brilliant. So in a learning and teaching environment, if you have questions about how to do something, way beyond the specifics that we'd address today, join Twitter, look at the, you know, it's a very popular thing through the teaching community if people are not already there. Okay, so Twitter is something I can thoroughly recommend. And having fallen for Twitter, then I would thought, how can I use Twitter in my own lecture courses? And, of course, I can't do this in any compulsory kind of a fashion. Twitter is not like email. It's not like Blackboard. It's not one of those things that we compel our students to do. So we have to try and add some value if we're going to get students to do it. Student, anybody who's tried to get students blogging on a forum or something like that will know that unless there's some really strong carrot or stick involved, then they really don't want to know. It's, they see it as additional work. They won't participate in it. So what I thought is I'll start off small, I'll just add some content into a particular chemistry module. And in order to do that, I set up a new Twitter account. So it's very easy to do. All you need is an email address. So I created a Gmail email address for my module, and then I created a Twitter account. And I started to tweet things from this Twitter account. Basically, they were snippets. They were my own impressions of how lectures had gone. And very quickly, the students started to follow it. I found that about a third to a half of the students followed this Twitter link. Presumably, the other ones are not interested in any kind of technology. I, I don't know what their motivations are. I haven't evaluated that in any way. But what I liked, what was very nice for me was this very quickly became a two-way Thing. I didn't want to broadcast information to the students. I wanted to engage the students on the module. And so when the students started to tweet, I had a really good experiment today. I made beautiful green crystals. Or the way to do this experiment is to add a nice shiny piece of zinc. They started to engage with the module and present information that was helpful, interesting to me, but very interesting to their peers. The other thing I wanted to do is I thought maybe I could use this thing live in the lectures. And that's where it became a little bit more difficult because to some extent, and maybe some of you will get this experience today, if you start tweeting through the lectures, if you overdo it like anything else, it can start to look gimmicky and it can start to uh, be a, a distraction, essentially. And the other thing is how do you, you know, how if you're presenting a PowerPoint or indeed a Prezi, how do you get that content integrated seamlessly into your lecture? I'm very pleased to say that there are some tools. And Paul, there are um, Twitter tools to allow you to do this within Prezi as well. So for example, I've got one of these tools down here. People who are interested more in this can go to the sap.com website. But essentially what we've got down here is a real-time Twitter bar. And if I enable it, I can type in a search term. And some of people have been uh, helping me. Thank you very much. And I've set up 
sorry, obsessed. Okay, learning and teaching 2011. So if there's anybody here, and there's many people here, more closely involved in the organization of this, forgive me. I should have discussed with you what the hash code for this uh, event was going to be, but I basically arbitrarily decided to do this one. We can change that if someone tells me that this is not the official hash code for UEA's Learning and Teaching Day, but uh, unless someone tells me otherwise, um, I'm assuming it is. So what we've got is at the bottom here, now a scrolling list of tweets as they come in. And I recognize some of those names and I recognize some of those tweets as not being my own. So thank you. I was very carefully listening to the presentations this morning and, as I would argue, my attention was increased by the fact that I was actually abstracting those presentations and tweeting information. I'm not one of those people who believes that students are focused completely on what I'm saying for 50 minutes during a lecture. Their attention comes in, fades out, fades in. I do lots of things to try and keep their attention as much as possible, but if they're going to be playing with whatever devices, if they're tweeting something relevant to my lecture, isn't that better than them simply daydreaming about what they did in the club the night before. That's my own philosophy on this. Other people would have a different philosophy. OK, so how do you integrate this with PowerPoint or Prezi? You can get tools like this either for PowerPoint and Prezi. And what I've done here, what I found is if I ask a question on a slide, Twitter is too slow, it's too clumsy to get immediate response. So what I've tended to do is to ask one sort of big question that catches the attention, gets the sort of forensic, investigative, detective part of the students' minds working throughout the lecture. So I have a similar question this morning for you, and that is, what does this lecture, the one that I'm presenting now, have in common with the front cover of this Droster chocolate? So hopefully this is a fairly iconic image. Anybody who's ever been to Holland will be familiar with this. What has this lecture, and it'll become much more obvious later if it isn't now, got in common with that front cover of Joster Chocolate? Okay, so that is the other way in which you can present these. You can have a scrolling bar at the bottom, or if you have a pause in your lecture to discuss something, then how about using one of these power PowerPoint slides as a sort of back channel method to bring up all of the tweets that people have been doing? Okay. You're not here to hear about Twitter, although hopefully that didn't annoy you too much. What you're here to hear about are screencasts and vignettes. So what is a screencast? Well, let's go back a little bit, okay? A podcast is a digital media file which is released episodically, so uh, you, you, know, you can uh, release them regularly or you can release them on occasion. You put them up on the web and you can use methods like RSS in order to actually access things. So that's a podcast, and a podcast is a pretty broad definition. For me, a podcast, when I started, I was referring to things as podcasts. What I meant was an audio recording. So when I started this process, it was in the academic year 2006, 2007, and all I was doing is recording my voice. I was recording the soundtrack to my lecture and putting those things up on the web. Of course, I thought I could do better than that, and the technology became uh, available thanks to the, the learning and teaching technologists that I'm pleased to say are here now. I became aware of Camtasia. Camtasia can allow us to produce screencasts. So what's the difference between a, an audio recording? A screencast is not a total lecture capture. It's not a video of me waving my hands around, strutting about the, the lecture theater. A screencast is the slides as they appear on the screen with your audio narration synchronized. So the audio's coming at the same time that things evolve on the screen. So that's what a screencast is. And essentially, for me, a screencast is then basically a video and audio podcast. So those are how the terms go together. Now, what you can put words, you can get them on, on uh, Wikipedia, but of course what you really need is an example. I believe in teaching these things by example. So, screencasting, how hard can it possibly be to generate a screencast? Well, 
Kaktus, Bayerbäcker. Oh, Kaktus. Kaktus hat Möns. Chaos. Fubitis. Gayhouses. Flags. Pokalis. Lords and ladies, rich people. Servants, poor people. Longstone walls. The Great Hall. The Great Hall is... It is very busy. It is where they eat. They play music when they have a party. Servants have to serve everyone food. The Dungeons. They get in the dungeon if they do something the king and queen don't like. They get in the dungeon if they don't work hard enough. They must be scared in the dungeon. I think there are skeletons and skulls in the dungeon. There are rats, mice, spiders, bugs and wasps. It must be all slimy. I think they will have to stay in the dungeon forever. Thank you for watching my work on castles. Okay. She is six. And that is the QR code. Uh, I can see Laura's going. That is the QR code that takes you to the YouTube page. So please scan in that QR code. Go to the YouTube page and watch that to get more hits for Abigail's castle video. And while you're there, there are a lot more screencasts by Abigail as well. And she'd be made up if you go to those and look at them and increase the number of hit counts. But you, you know, you don't have to. Right. How do you generate these screencasts? Well, as I said, I've been doing um, podcasting since 6, 7, and 2009, 2010 was the first year that I recorded screencasts. Um, the way that I do it is basically to take this kit here, because I've become very f um, keen on the audio content. All the studies of videos say that it doesn't really matter if the video is a little bit grainy. Of course, you need to be able to read the text if it's got lecture content. It doesn't matter if the video is a little bit grainy. What students really pick up on and what's really important to students is the audio quality. So I recommend that you do use something like this broadcast radio mic system. So I'm kitted up now. I'm actually going to record this. So I'm making a screencast of this thing about screencasts. So what I would recommend is you use a radio mic system, but it actually means that if you do that, you can get very lip small lipstick things that work through Bluetooth that are very much easier to carry around. You need to carry around a radio mic broadcasting thing and uh, a laptop. I carry around a laptop. It would be possible to install Camtasia on all of the university computers. It hasn't been done at the moment. We don't have a campus license for the software. And because of the multimedia content, I choose to present my lectures on my own laptop. But logistically speaking, physically speaking, those are the things that you actually need. Now, as I said, in 2009-10, I was doing this on my own. As far as I know, I was essentially the only person screencasting a mainstream lecture course at UEA at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, it was good to come along to a situation like this, good to see that there was a lot of interest in doing this kind of thing. But in, within chemistry at least, um, not within chemistry and pharmacy, because Paul is very good at this as well, but within chemistry I felt a little bit isolated. But I went to a chem variety in chemistry meeting that year and noticed that there were one or two people also doing something similar. But again, they were doing it in isolation as individuals. They were just one or two a faculty members producing maybe 10 lectures on a particular course. So we got together and put together a physical sciences departmental grant to see what would it be like if we could take not just part of a lecture course, but to podcast, to screencast as much as possible of a whole year of a degree program. And that's what we've been doing in chemistry. We've been recording all of the first year of the chemistry degree program and putting that together as a coherent set of screencast archives with funding from the uh, Higher Education Academy. Okay, now I've talked a little bit about um, Camtasia and I'll show you um, what Camtasia is like. If you do want to do screencasting or you just want to try screencasting, there are some cheap 
simple ways of doing it. There's ScreenToaster.com, which is a web-based application to do this. There's Jing, which is a light version of Camtasia. But actually, what I would recommend is that you download <laughs> Camtasia. Camtasia is available from the TechSmith website for a one-month fully functional trial. So it's fully functional. You can download Camtasia, generate all those screencasts. If you get organized enough, you could create an entire archive of material in that month and then have the license lapse. I don't think that will happen. I think if you get into the screencasting thing, you'll want to pay the some for the, uh, for the license. But I'm not a sales rep for TechSmith, so I have no ax to grind there. Now, what I want you to, to, to do is to show you how straightforward this is. So who here has done some home video editing? Anyone ever use Movie Maker or something similar to do a bit of home video editing? OK, a few of you have. If you've done that, then you will be familiar with the methods of editing that are actually present in the Camtasia suite. For those of you who are not, then I've got a screen in energy associated here. with it. What exactly is meant by bond disassociation okay. energy? It's the energy to take a molecule of uh, something like hydrogen and break it into two discrete atoms. OK, so follow the cursor is my advice. I don't have a laser pointer here, but if you follow, sorry, the pointer. Atoms. The pointer here, what this is actually illustrating is how to edit a Camtasia file. So if you noticed, there was a table on there that was really beyond the end of this. Why should it appear? I decided to chop it out, and this is how simple it is to actually take a part of the, of the screencast that you don't want atoms. and remove it. OK, and now I've got the thing in a position. So the, point, the pointer is now showing the sort of options. So one of the beauties of Camtasia, which makes it better than Screen Toaster and better than Jing, are the huge variety of options that it gives you for output. So you can tailor the output in any fashion, any resolution that you want. You can make it specific to things like iPods and iPhones. People can carry around fully functioning multimedia versions of your lectures. A complete lecture suite on their iPod would be a, a very straightforward thing for them to be able to do. OK, so you can play with various tools on here, add title clips, change the narration, add in extra bits of sound. It really is a fully functioning video editing suite which also has the capacity for recording the screen and for recording the PowerPoint presentations. So that's editing these things. For me, this is one of the things that really fascinates me. I am a bit spontaneous in lectures. I'm a bit unscripted, and I make mistakes. And I'm a bit clumsy. I say um and er uh, on occasion. I admit to all of these things, but I've also got OCD, and I'm a perfectionist. So I hate listening to these things back. It's one of those things you have to get over if you want to record your own lectures. You have to become familiar with the sound of your own voice, or perhaps not. So do you edit it, or do you not edit it? When I started doing this, I thought most people would want to edit their lectures. Most people would want to cut out the ums and ahs, want to get rid of the, the verbal accidents that happen during the course of a lecture. No, that's just me. So what I found is that most of my colleagues were perfectly happy to put, to record the lecture and then to put that material onto the web unedited. In fact, I, I guess the, the reality is that they don't make as many mistakes as I do. So there's no need to edit if you're going for realism in your lectures, if you want to save time in these processes. If you do want to edit, then you can delete the unnecessary material. So there's a bit of introduction at the beginning of most lectures. There's a bit of see you next time at the end of most lectures that really doesn't need to be in the archives. You can remove any mistakes, if you're like me, and you make them. You can polish up on the ums and ahs. Now, I don't know many lecturers who never say um and they never say ah. And Maybe when it's a live occurrence like this, you can get away with a little bit. If you're listening back in a sort of sterile environment and you hear all these pregnant pauses, all these ums and the ahs, they sound uncomfortable. At least to me, they sound uncomfortable, and I'd like to get rid of them. And of course, it's a, it's a very marginal thing, but you produce smaller files when you do that. OK, so I've said already you can have lots of different formats if you do this. 
So you can actually get retina level resolutions with these things, assuming that you recorded it in that format and you actually want to waste that much disk space doing it. But it's perfectly possible to have high res, very high resolution recordings of your lectures. Once you've recorded these lectures and you physically have them, what are you going to do with them? It's no good them sitting on your hard disk. What you want to do is you want to make those lectures available in as facile a means as possible to your undergraduate students. And there are two ways in which you can do that. The first of these that I'm going to illustrate with this screencast, the podcast tool on Blackboard. So for those of you who haven't used the podcast tool on Blackboard, this is a screencast of it in action. I'm going to uh, one of my websites. We have lots of screencasts on here. I'm choosing one particular one so to see. So this is how it appears elements, within the Blackboard environment. Obviously start with carbon. Now, as I understand it, you have a module get much entitled this, The Chemistry of Carbon Compounds. So perhaps it won't surprise you to know that I'm not going to spend a long time talking about carbon. This is not linear. You don't uh, have to listen to the whole 50-minute lecture. You can skip ahead to the bit the student's interested. You can play the bit the student doesn't silicon. understand so make over and over again. No so this is where screencasts really, really win over live to, lectures in, in the sense that students can control the pace and the repetition of their own learning. So we skipped ahead there from carbon to silicon chemistry. If every single lecture at UEA was podcast using the Blackboard system, the system could not cope. Okay? That's a fact. But there is a system that I'm told could cope. And that system is UEA's Helix server. So AVS maintain a streaming server. And if you're interested, go to the web address HML. Uh, uea.ac.uk and this is a screening server that we all as faculty members can put information up you can do that already students have only access to to look at the information that's on there the organization is not as good in my opinion as blackboard and we'll see another feature that is better on blackboard in a moment but if i demonstrate the helix server this is the, um, the home page for the Helix server. There is a video on there of Eddie Izzard getting his honorary degree, if uh, that will incite you to go and have a look. I've used, not surprisingly, the uh, example of some chemistry lectures on there. There are now um, over 50 chemistry lectures on the streaming survey, which means I think that chemistry is, is uh, in the lead slightly. But there are many from MBS and AVS, so I'm, I'm not claiming a monopoly on this. So this is the, what you get. You get so we've done quite a bit in determining the, the shapes of molecules. But what we need to do is to go one step beyond this now. And if you determine the shape of a molecule and determine that that molecule has, or don't determine the Lewis structure of that molecule, and determine that that structure has either okay, less than eight electrons. So if a structure has less, the beauty of the Helix server is that it basically, I mean, you can stream it to any number of different multimedia devices, be it a PC, be it a mobile phone, something like this. But the Helix server has, uh, as far as I know, uh, essentially unlimited capacity. If you're running into difficulties hosting multimedia files on Blackboard, and this goes beyond screencasting and vignettes, then the Helix server is perhaps the solution that you've been uh, looking for. Chris Brown if he were here, would certainly tell us that the Helix server is the solution uh, of choice for things like this. So what are we doing? Right, so, so far we've made good progress in chemistry. I said we were recording the entire first year degree. Well, we would if all the faculty were participating. I'm very pleased. I have to say thank you to all the chemistry faculty. We have managed to record more than half of all the first year undergraduate lectures and get more than half of all the first year undergraduate chemistry lectures available in a format so that the students could have looked at them over Easter, can continue to look, up, look at them during the revision period for the degrees. So this is a summary of those screencasts that we've uh, recorded to date. So there's well over 50 recorded there and our collaborators at Southampton have recorded a similar number. 
Now, the beauty for me of using Blackboard, I'd be very reluctant, especially during this evaluation phase, to go over to using the streaming server. Because the beauty of using Blackboard is that Blackboard tracks very useful statistics. The streaming server tells you how many times someone's looked at the file. It does that. But it doesn't tell you when they looked at the file. It doesn't tell you what day they looked at the file on. It doesn't tell you what time they looked at the file on. Blackboard does. So you can extract information like this. So you can see that UEA is very nearly, or UEA students are very nearly 24 hour accessors of Blackboard and the, vin uh, and the screencasts that are on there. The, certainly the peak times are certainly very busy still, even between um, midnight and one o'clock in the morning, accessing these things. How valuable a teaching experience it is at that time, I have no idea. But they're certainly accessing these things seven days a week. And what you can also do is see this one, and this against, I don't know if everyone can see this at the back, this X scale along here is the date. So these are the hits, the number of hits on a given day. And immediately, you can see a clustering of activity. And this clustering of activity is very easy to understand. This is when the lectures went live. This is when they had tutorials on the lectures. This is when they had a course test on the lecture. This was the final examination. And this smaller cluster here was re-examinations, reassessment period. So the usage of this is very closely tied to when students feel they, use, they need the material. So they will use it as part of their revision process. Some of you may have opinions about whether it's the best way to revise, but that is how our students can if they choose to use this material. These are some of the evaluation quotes that we got. This is from the normal course module evaluation forms. Students who comment, comment positively. Students who comment full stop are really quite thin and far between, but those students who do comment on the evaluation process tend to say really quite positive things, often along the lines of, I wish someone, everyone else was doing this as well. Now, what about the strengths and the weaknesses? Well, logistically, it does require a little bit of effort in terms of weakness. It's a little bit time consuming. It's not anything like as time consuming for the average academic as it is for me with my obsessive behaviors. But it does take a little bit of time to do it. Right, does it discourage lecture attendance? Not in my lectures, no. Because I feel very strongly that a lecture is an awful lot more than the sum of what appears on the screen and what I say. I am constantly trying to get information from my students, engage my students in the actual lecture process. And they seem to understand that. So whereas I put, I go as far as putting these screencasts, this is the second year I'm doing this, all my lecture course was available online before I started lecturing. The screencast recording of the previous year's lectures were available to the students before I'd given a single lecture on the course. And the attendance in the lectures was still higher than the average attendance for the rest of the module. So no, students understand that the best time to see the lecture for real is the first time it's presented, where they get a of an opportunity to actually participate in the lecture. So I don't, I don't find that at all. I mean, that's certainly a concern that people voice. And, and it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to, to, to me. And also, the other people I've spoken to who are doing this kind of thing, it doesn't happen to them either. So I, I don't think that's as big a concern as, as, as people think. Obviously, it's a learning aid. It's a particularly important learning aid for those students who, and perhaps English is not their first language. And they want to, they're going in the lecture, and the lecture is going quite quickly. They didn't get it the first time. They want to listen to it again. Or perhaps they're dyslexic, and they're finding difficulties making notes. Obviously, the usage pattern suggests that these things are viewed as being a revision aid. And of course, there's this illness contingency. The screencast is not as good as turning up to the lecture, but it's better than only having the slides available, for example. So it is a, an illness contingency of some part. Self-observation is part of UEA academic practice that we all self-observe. Observe with a very diplomatic, very polite colleague who comes along and goes, yes, 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 it's a very good lecture. I'll tick all the tick boxes. Or you can listen to it yourself. And nobody will be a bigger critic of your performance than yourself. So in terms of self-observation, 
And I've self-observed all my lectures, some of them more than once. So I know all my faults, I know all my foibles, I edit some of them out, others I actively am trying to improve upon. And the other thing that many of you will have noticed, I know it goes on a lot in the School of Pharmacy, students bringing their own dictaphones into the lectures. They put their dictaphone, some of them will ask you, some of them won't ask you. They put it down on the desk, they record the whole lecture. That's very easy to do with a smartphone now. It's probably going on a lot more than we think. If I can provide a better quality output than they can, where's the incentive for them to do that? And then, then I re also retain editorial control over the process. So you will hear on some of these screencasts, you will have noticed all the background coughing. You don't notice it when you're lecturing, you notice it when you're hearing it back. How much worse must that be with an open um, mic um, dictaphone bang in the middle of the lecture theatre? So the quality that we can provide is so much better. So I really believe, and I've said this already, that these screencasts are good, but they're no substitute for the lecture experience, and I haven't found them being a substitute for the lecture experience. Does it discourage note-taking? Well, note-taking hardly happens in chemistry anyway. So you, very difficult to discourage something that was barely happening at all. And actually, those students who take good notes are those who go away and then use them to annotate some sort of report and write it up afterwards. If you're doing that, it downright facilitates it because you can then listen to the screencast and generate your own notes in a more comprehensive way. So one of the things that going over to PowerPoint allowed me to do is not to wait while everybody writes down every line, but the time that I save, because everybody isn't writing down every line, I use by asking the students to think, by asking the students to interact. So I note-taking is one approach to doing this. I just find that most students don't note-take, and since they're not note-taking, I'd rather they were participating in some other way. Uh, but it could be argued to facilitate note-taking. There are some drawbacks with screencasts. Screencasts are typically, once I've edited them down, about 40 minutes long. So if you were going to revise for a lecture course, are you really, do we really believe the best way to revise for a lecture course is to listen to every lecture again back to back? Students might think they're revising in that process, but I suggest that they won't really be learning very much at all. The other thing, of course, is what I've said to you over and is that I value interaction during the lectures. I believe lectures should be dynamic experiences. Listening to screencasts, watching screencasts, is not a dynamic, interactive experience. So I wanted to basically do something that was inspired by Paul, who will be lecturing at, um, later, and basically to create what Paul calls, and it's his term, vignettes. Vignettes are short segments of a lecture. So I don't think I can condense my entire lecture course, but I can recognise the really important points. I can take those really important points from my lecture, and I can use the tools available in Camtasia to augment, to reintroduce the interactivity. And I'll give you an example of one of these. So we now created, we want this to be a cross-modular thing. We've now created an archive of vignettes that our chemistry students can access, and indeed any students can access these. There are students doing some chemistry and pharmacy who might find this very focused, very short resource valuable. So you can find it, you choose one of these things, launch it, and it runs using something called SCORM. So it runs in Blackboard, but actually in a dynamic communication with Blackboard. So you can host them on web pages, but it works better embedded in Blackboard. So you get a window that looks like this. For some reason, unknown to anybody else, it asks for your password again. Completely redundant, but take it up with Joe. You know. <laughs> Joe knows all about SCORM. OK, so it all very quickly um, interactivity and highlighting these things. You can use zooming functions, you can do all sorts of things. You can inject additional pieces of text. On average, I would say there is one critical concept in every chemistry lecture. That's not to say the rest of the chemistry lecture is redundant, but there is one concept that's absolutely key to further understanding of chemistry, and that's the concept that we've extracted from each lecture and turned into a vignette. So we are generating as many vignettes as we are lectures. Something like 60 of these vignettes will populate a dedicated module. Because I don't know if it's a problem in biology or other schools, we're forever criticising our students for compartmentalising their knowledge. 
They learn something on one module, they cannot use it on another module. That's something we recognise all the time in chemistry, and we reinforce that sometimes in the way we teach. Some modules we might teach exactly the same thing in two different modules, and those two lecturers were not talking to one another, and they're presenting slightly different takes on the practice. So what I really want to do with these vignettes is get beyond, a bit like in the new academic model, get beyond the course module structure and move to simply a set of chemistry vignettes which are going to be interconnected with one another and standing outside of the module structure. Because chemistry is an interconnected subject and sometimes this preoccupation with modules is not healthy and is not the best way to teach something. Now, what we do have is a programme to evaluate all of this, and Joe Bruce and Gerpart Gill are playing a great role in this. So we're going to evaluate this through a typical Likert-type scale of um, questionnaire, looking at technical quality, teaching value, convenience, location and amount. We also have funding to look at this through a focus group approach. That work is ongoing and we'll be doing the focus groups in the very near future once the students have really had a chance to use these resources in anger. So that. Conclusions and summary. Well, screencasting, I believe, has become a straightforward thing to do. My six-year-old can do it. It's a straightforward thing to do. She's very clever, but, you know, she's only six. It's popular with the students. Unfor I mean, it's popular with the students. You'd be amazed how quickly students can start taking stuff for granted, though. But it is popular with the students. Screencasts, perhaps, what's an OER? An OER is an open educational resource. So in order to get departmental funding from a, a quango, you need to be able to demonstrate that these things are transferable. Nobody wants to listen to your lecture. It's, an, it's a loser. You're either better than they are, okay, in which case they look bad, or your lecture is inferior to the one that they can provide, in which case their students are going to lose. So nobody wants a transferred screencast of a lecture. These vignettes are small enough and different enough from a lecture that we want to explore whether they might actually be useful open or educational resources that we could get out there. So we've recorded all these lectures already, we're busy producing the vignettes, we're in the peak viewing season at the moment and the evaluations will have to wait for another time. Just to say that in my opinion Twitter is fun, has lots of learning and teaching connotations, maybe you won't use it in a lecture but get yourself on Twitter and see what is out there. The number of resources for anybody interested in learning and teaching innovation is massive and you don't have to look for them with Twitter, they come to you. That is the beauty of Twitter for me. So I need to acknowledge all my colleagues in chemistry who've coped to regenerate this archive. Joanne Bruce, Andy Mee, who um, without them I wouldn't know about these kind of things. Paul, who coined the term vignette and keeps pushing me on so that chemistry can keep up with pharmacy. Gerpe, Kate and everybody in CZ who um, helps with these processes. Elizabeth Jacobs and Kiri Anderson are the ones actually producing these vignettes. It takes time to produce these vignettes, time that I don't have, so I pay the postgrads to do it. That's the beauty of having this um, higher education funding. There we have some collaborators at Southampton here. And of course, I'd like to thank all the guinea pigs for this, all the students who've actually participated in this, who've given their opinions, who've been passive recipients in some of cases for this information. And then finally, let's see if anybody's tweeted something during the course of the lecture and uh, if you have any questions I'd be more than happy to answer them. Also I am recording this and I am going to put it up on the web as a screencast so if anybody wants to do it they can do it. Anybody recognize what the similarity between this and the Droster chocolate front thing is? Yes. I, I, yes, yes. Uh, at one point I was showing you a, a screencast of editing a screencast and that's going to go into this screencast. So there are at least three layers of screencasting in here, possibly arguably more. So yes, that was the similarity that I had.